Welcome to Threads of Enlightenment, a podcast devoted to helping you overcome challenges in your life that prevent you from becoming the best version of yourself. Each episode features interviews with people from all walks of life about their journey of self-development and the principles they utilize to overcome their fears to achieve their desired outcome. Ready to be enlightened? Here's your host, Ken Primus. Welcome to another episode of Threads of Enlightenment. As usual, this is my favorite space right here. Why? Because I get to welcome our guests because I know they're coming with a couple of things I deem very expensive, their time. What a beautiful and precious commodity. And I want to thank this individual that is before us, Gina. She has afforded us her precious time. And you guys know how I feel about time. That is such a beautiful woman. You have to learn how to love her, respect her, give her honor. If you do, she will respect you. But if you don't, I can see you in a minute what she will do to you. The other is the journey. The journey is a powerful creator. It has created that individual that is before us in the body, in the essence of Gina. And so we want to thank her and give her honor for coming and sharing both of these precious commodity here with us at Threads of Enlightenment. Thank you so much for coming and being a part of the Threads of Enlightenment family. Thank you again for coming. Thank you, Ken. And to everyone out there, I just want to send a giant bubble around all of us and bring us closer, almost like if we're sitting around a fire so we can actually connect on a soul level and feel each other's essence and being. Thank you so much. I open myself to that as well, that invitation. And as they say in some of the meetings that they have in in corporate America that I've been there and politics, I second that. Mm -hmm. So one of the customs that we do here at Threads of Enlightenment is to ask this precious question. I think it's such a beautiful question, by the way. It's um, how do you serve mankind? As I mentioned to you, it is not just for you. It's to remind the audience that um, this journey is uh, about us together as it is about themselves learning who they are first, but also walking together, as you say, and getting a chance to experience each other. How do you serve mankind? Thank you for that question. I'm reflected on a quote that was kind of given to me when I was very young. You know, we we all come in this world with a a traumatic story um, and I was living it in the physical with an abusive father. And that's what kind of led into my story, which is healing suicidal ideation. But when I was a child, I got this saying, and I didn't know what it was literally until about 40 years later, but it, it was, you are the joy that nothing else is. Your soul is the most valuable thing you own. Take care of it. And I was very young and I didn't understand what it was. And I went on a whole journey. And now I understand that word joy has so much power, those three letters. It's literally what we are walking into every day if we can. That is where we can live our best life. And through this journey, I've been able to recognize a few themes and gifts in my soul's journey in this life that I'm supposed to do here to help humanity. And it is so wonderful when you actually do get to uncover these things and the one thing is I'm supposed to be, and I, and I am now is a cipher, which I didn't even know when I heard that word, exactly what that meant. And now mm-hmm. it's become so clear to me why, what it is and why I'm here. And when I looked back at my journey, understanding the word cipher. So the word cipher is I am supposed to communicate with a, a higher source and like translate the communication and put it down for people without interjecting my own bias information in there and to be kind of a clear channel and to share that with the world. And the second thing I'm supposed to do is just literally be a carer, which means I'm just supposed to care. And it's a powerful assignment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I always encourage people to find their own assignment. I do not believe that we were we came to this planet to have a job and then die. It sounds morbid when you even say it. And so I believe we all came with an assignment, something that will expose us to this joy on a constant basis. Um, Not saying life is going to be easy, 
but that joy is going to become a part of your companion, part of your friends, the quivers that walk with you and guide you and support you. And it's a powerful energy that one can be exposed to. One of the customs that we do here is go back in this time machine that allows us to travel, if you will, time travel, and that is the memory. And you had stated that your about your abusive beginnings, if you will. And that's the space that I usually start, uh, Gina, because I believe within that group that we call a family, I believe many of our traumas begin right there. And that trauma is the genesis by which we are now going to formulate our thoughts, our actions, our decisions, which becomes our lifestyle and all of these different things. We have a group of people, one, and we are told that they're called mom and dad, but mom and dad sometimes can be some of the most uh, dangerous people in one's life, as I know myself and I know that you are familiar with that. What was your family unit like? when you, you came into this uh, plane and resided with this group of family that are strangers, but they call us, they call them family. What was that like to you while you were there in that grouping? Well, I was born in 1970, so it, that was the feeling. Both of my parents were kind of wild, as in my mom was a dancer and my dad was a car salesman, and I had a little brother who was from another man, and they... They were just enjoying all the things of life. My dad had just come back from the Korean War and had been shot in the head. So he had um, a metal plate in his head. And um, that was actually creating um, some unknown issues in his life, that he had this metal plate in his head. And his father, I found out later once I uh, researched my family history, was exactly the same as he was, very abusive and um, had the same tendencies. So um it was a rock and roll lifestyle. It was um, my mom went back to dancing three weeks after I was born. I was left sometimes um, uh, weeks alone as uh, they would just go out on adventures, be held up in uh, for drunk driving or whatever it was. I was very we were we were abused. My dad would get would drink, and uh, I think he broke my nose when I was about six years old. It was very violent. And also I didn't have the, the affection that I wanted and um, nobody paid attention to me. I spent a lot of time alone and that loneliness um, as a child was just so confusing because I didn't understand. I didn't feel safe, number one, which is um, a horrible thing to get over. And, and when you do finally get over that feeling that of safety as an adult, it's a wonderful thing, but that's something that I really needed to heal was where do I feel safe and how do I demand that in my space? And then, you know, my dad was married 11 times. So he was sort of like this, um, uh, like Romeo, he just loved being in love. He, he craved that affection as well. And so it was a big cycle and I did eventually get to see the whole cycle. And when I separated myself from it, when I was doing my healing and uh, where I was evolving and uh, learning about my my whole existence as mind, body, soul, and spirit. And I was able to look at it as this wonderful learning experience and just actually feel, get to the point where I felt grace of every single situation that happened to me and to surround it with love and just um, understand that it taught me how to be a warrior. It taught me how to be strong. It taught me how to stand up for myself. And, you know, I'm on that other side now. And I just really appreciate that when you get to the other side, it, when you're in it and you're on, in the middle of the mountain, it's debilitating, it's hard, but you see how strong as a soul you are once you get to that top of the mountain. And I feel like I was able to, as I got to the top of the mountain and kind of really fall really into this forgiveness and love for everything that happened. I sprouted wings and I was able to fly down from that mountain. And that's kind of where I find myself today. I can't wait to unpack all of that uh, because <laughs> I know how it is uh, when we talk about what we've gone through and, and uh, how beautiful that picture is because we have seen and understand the purpose of the pain. I tell people when you understand the purpose of the pain, but it takes a long time to, to get to that understanding. 
when we're going through the pain, all we can see is the pain, and all we can experience is the pain. I was talking with my uh, fiance t today about the fact of my mom. Um, I couldn't remember when when my mom first told me she loved me, but I remember as an adult after I started. I knew some of her life. I could see why she was the way she was, and I understood it. But I remember later on in my life when she did begin to say those words to me and how valuable they were. But I was a grown man when I first heard those words. Uh, I had my own kids. So it becomes a precious uh, memory of when you have it because as a child, you were, you were seeking it and mm -hmm. uh, wanting it. And we all are hunting after that. Um, your dad, you could see it in the fact that all those relationships, he was hunting after that as well. Uh, so here you are, this young being that has been uh, really traumatized within the family unit uh, due to the lifestyle and the decision-making of mom and dad. Um, how did you relate to others outside of mom and dad, uh, meaning some of your friends and stuff like that, especially when you're growing up as a young child? How did you relate to them? Well, this is something I had to kind of uh, fix in myself because well, I, I was just seeking love from yeah. everyone. And what happens is is you, with when you don't have discernment and you don't have boundaries and you're not taught that as a child and you mm -hmm. just seek love because you feel unworthy of love and you don't understand why you haven't gotten it, you will seek that in people that are really wrong for you. You will do anything you can to keep that person in your life because you don't want to be abandoned. And that's where, you know, you can go really horribly wrong. And that's where sort of my suicidal ideation came from, where I felt I wasn't meant to be on this planet or to be here um, because I would seek solace in people that could see that I was a wounded individual and they would, ex they, they would use my light and my energy and my childlike spirit and they would use it in many ways. They would, um, you know, uh, physically. And um, I, I've actually moved out when I was 14. I've been on my own since I was 14. Uh -huh. So I was exposed to a lot of um, sexual activity very young. And I was very afraid. I didn't know how to handle that. And um, a lot of situations in that and got abused and hurt. Sorry, my dog. And so you bring in these sort of like darker energies that will just eat up every little bit of life in you. And um, and I embraced him because I was afraid to even lose those people. When I finally, and then I became suicidal because I just, I didn't feel love. I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere. I felt completely disconnected. I felt like I was given the wrong situation. I would watch other people um, having loving relationships or parents that cared about them or going on vacations and things like that. And I literally would just um, feel self-pity, so much self-pity. And that self-pity would take me into the deepest, darkest holes where I would literally just, you know, imagine my death and imagine leaving the planet. When you finally take that control of that though, and learn how valuable you are and how worthy you are and surround yourself with love first, you will start to bring in, um, that kind of like energy people that are going to treat you the same way you treat them. And that's sort of where I am now. And everybody in my life, we're on an equal playing field and there's just so much love. And I'm just so grateful that I've gotten to this other side because it was really scary because when you are have already been abused and abandoned. And now you're in these um, situations with these nefarious energies. You're afraid to even lose them, be even though they treat you terribly. <laughs> yeah. um, and learning how to overcome the fear of letting go of people that aren't there to help me anymore. Uh, that that one lesson just, it, it kind of saved my life because I was able to discern the, the people in my life. Because when you are a light, you will attract so much dark. It just, mm -hmm. it comes on you. And you don't understand that when you're, especially when you're young. Yeah, but you see that, as I said on the onset, the natural realm is a window into the spiritual realm. When you have darkness and you turn on the light, especially when you're outside, isn't it fascinating how all kinds of creatures are attracted to that light? I mean, bugs come out of all over the place. I mean, before you know it, you're running around trying to hide because there's so many bugs are attracted to you. 
in the natural realm when you have that light on. Correct. And that is and, the same and, in yeah. the spiritual realm. I feel like now we all dance with the dark. There's there's light, there's dark, and there's shadow, right? So there's the yeah. gray. And we are all constantly dancing with that. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. we need all of it. And once you get to that point where you can dance with every part of it, I call it like a dance because it makes it easier. It's like, okay, there's some dark energy coming. We're never going to be not have darkness in our life or the mm -hmm. dark energy in our life. But we can dance with it. And we can um, understand it a little more. And then we can say, oh, thank you for your lesson today. Now, bye-bye, you know, or yeah. whatever. You get into this flow of life a little bit more. It doesn't, you know, stop you and stop your progress moving forward. You you work with it. The obstacles and conflicts come every day for all of us. And it's almost like we're training ourselves how to deal with the things that are going to come. And if we can move through them with grace, we've already won half the bot. Yeah, we are reprogramming our minds because uh, the dance is, is, as you said, in certain cultures, we call that the yin and yang dance in the Asian culture and the Japanese. And then uh, there are other chi, all the different cultures have that same term uh, understanding with different terminologies and stuff like that. But that's a normal part of it. And I think it is, uh, we are learning how to switch control from the natural realm to the supernatural realm, which is that soul individual. When we give that individual ownership or control, if you will, then our life begins to become much more stabilized in the sense where we begin to become creators, designers with our thoughts and our behavior and stuff like that versus the default living from the programming of the conscious mind because that conscious mind is seeking satisfaction all the time, temporary satisfaction. But the soul is wanting more of a deeper connection. And so the journey is to make that switch. And that takes time, um, takes years to do that. So here's this girl again. Um, there's so much to unpack that, that in this young individual that she's going through. And as when we are traumatized and not healed, we will pull the same energy that we are familiar with. And those are the people that will hurt us because we are familiar with that action and that behavior. And so there's a, these, uh, there's a uh, depravity of comfort, if you will, right there in that exchange. And then we know we're being abused, but we are wanting out and we don't know how to get out. And so the process is understanding the way to get out. So here you are, you're in it, you're seeing it. And um, how did you begin? Escort yourself out from that control and the behavior of others based on your behavior. How did you begin to heal yourself? Because you have to go on this journey to begin to find out who you are what caused you to begin that journey gina well i finally got to the point where i was tired of living on the seesaw which it was like i'm feeling okay and then suicidal ideation anytime something would happen like my first husband was an alcoholic he was a rock star so he was playing in front of you know it was like i lived that life again i married that life again right like you said like energy brought more like energy because that was familiar to me. But although I really wanted this other experience. So um, the suicidal ideation for me was not constant. I was not a, never a depressed person, but I just didn't feel like I belonged here. And then when I would like lose a job or go through a divorce, anything very uh, full, it filled with grief, I would just say, see, I don't belong here. You know, this is never going to work. I'm never going to be happy here in this identity that was in my body, I needed to shed this identity and I needed to go into spirit and I needed to see how beautiful and wonderful my soul was. And so I finally got sick of the ideation. It was killing me. It was slowly killing me. And it's the reason why I wrote my book. And it's the reason why I'm on this journey really is to show people that there's another way other than living with suicidal ideation, because it's a slow death within itself. And I was basically in my mid thirties and I said, I I'm tired of living this way. I'm, yeah, either complete it and be done with it or figure out a way to heal it because this is slowly killing me anyways. This is no life to live. And in that journey, 
that's when I started to, I just went for it. Just like everything else I did in life. I had, I, I worked in it. I had a big job. I was very accomplished. I want to put that much love and energy into myself. And I did. And it was such hard work. And it was a period about 15 years. You know, I studied different religions and energy work and all these different things. And I would say, this is for me. That's not for me. And I literally almost designed my healing and what, and I just kind of started to slowly fall in love with myself. And I didn't realize I didn't love myself. I loved everyone else. I love my job. I love my friends. I love the people in my life. I gave them my shirt off my back. I gave them the hair off my head. I gave them the skin off my body, but I gave myself nothing. No wonder I didn't want to be here. No wonder. It's no wonder my head was wanted to leave. Anybody would have wanted to leave in that state. But I started to fall in love with myself. I started to see the light and the beauty. I started to feel my soul. I started to just not want to hurt this body at all. I wanted to fill it with great food. I wanted to like, and once you do that, oh my gosh, that was the number one thing. And everybody has a different path. It could be a certain religion or a certain practice. For me, the number one thing that changed for me is recognizing energy and how I had the power to transform energy into what I needed and wanted that I could look at something negative and say, I'm going to, I'm going to surround that with love and transform the energy. That energy was real, that I had so much energy in this and I had so much control and I was giving away all this control. And it's like, Nope, I have control now. And having that control, letting me drive my own ship and me being in charge that changed everything. And so I learned boundaries from that. I learned so much. I mean, unbelievable. So learning about energy, learning about colors and how they influence us and, and, you know, all that different, I don't know, Ener learning energy was such a big different thing for me. And then when you fall in love with yourself, you will learn your themes and gifts in this life that pr you prefer to live every day. All of a sudden, the paths just start to glisten and open up for you. You just start to hear, turn left, turn right. Your intuition gets sharper and you just feel more grounded. You feel centered in your in the center of your body. You walk with your heart held up high versus crouched and low. And so I do a practice when I walk into a room is like I pull my shoulders belt, I pull my heart up. And I let, and I look at people's eyes when they're talking to me, you know, I just, I have a different practice. Now I walk in the room with grace and seniority and I drop all the judgment and the fear and the criticism. And that's the programming you're talking about. We're programmed mm -hmm. to have all those things in us. And I've practiced not throwing judgment on other people as much as I can. And it is a practice because I don't yeah. want to hold that energy. I have too much to accomplish. I have too many people to get to with this message. I have to stay grounded and focused. I have to be careful who I allow in my space. And um, I have to honor myself first always. I do that now. And now I can give way more than I ever did, which is the interesting thing. Now I can actually give more than I ever could before mm -hmm. that now I give to myself more. So it's actually a win-win for everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's an illusion when we think other than how you are thinking right now. And again, as I said, the natural realm is a, just a, a foreshadowing. When we, we get on a plane, they tell you, you know, if anything happens to the plane and that mask comes down, don't focus on putting it on anyone else. Put it on you first. And so the focus has to be on you first. Because if you are, uh, if you inhale enough smoke, you're dead. You can't help anybody. You're done, you know. So... You need to make sure that you put that mask on and then you're able to help whoever your friends are and whatever, your, your kids, if you have it. But uh, the tendency is to go try to help someone, not realizing you're going to die in a couple of seconds. And so um, we just have to learn how to switch that. And that's yeah. what the journey is about, as you stated. And I always invite my listeners, and I know they probably get tired of me saying this, but it's the key to understanding much, to learn to transition to become a hearer. The principle is the hearer of the word will be justified, meaning that they are the ones that are going to get stuff done. A listener, like I, I always state, 
they'll find another podcast and then they'll go and listen again and miss it. They'll, you'll hear them say, oh, I've listened to 100,000 podcasts and nothing happened. Why? Because you haven't heard anything that anyone said. You just listen. And so I invite you guys to listen to what Gina's talking about because she's talking about some powerful stuff. She stated that she went and began to study. She wanted out. She's getting sick and tired of all the tendencies, thought patterns that are in her thought field of suicide. I don't belong here. And so she went on a journey to address that. And that journey caused her to study cause her to bring in data into her space from different uh, religions, science, whatever it is you bring into that. And the powerful thing that she stated was that she began to take in what helps and discard what doesn't. And that is the whole journey in a nutshell. Because when we do that, we will then formulate something special that is designed specifically for the self designed mm -hmm. for you that will help you to come out and become healed because you have now taken all the things that are necessary from all these belief systems these different uh, tools that are out there uh, meditation was a tool that i used the journaling was a tool that i used even running was a tool that i used that and again the running to me was a form of meditation I went and I did a lot of sound healing. Sound healing for me was in nature and the sound of nature. You have music, general music as well. You have the bowls that people do. But healing in sound is very important uh, to our, incorporate in your life. So find these tools, guys, and bring it into your life and begin to formulate your plan to rescue yourself it's only you going to rescue you and so um gina as you began to formulate your plan and began to implement it if you will from all these different studies that you did what were some of those thoughts we know of one that you talked about that thread the suicidal thought what other things did you begin to discover about yourself because as you discovered things you had to learn how to handle them if you will because you stated that you started to fall in love with yourself and didn't even know that you were out of love with yourself how did you discover that what were those things that caused you to discover that you were out of sync out of love with yourself well the first thing is that we use the word programming and i um and i like that but i uh, also will associate it with the different identities that we have that are earthly, right? So mm -hmm. the identity is what is actually dying and not, and what we want to die. For example, if you're going through a divorce and now all of a sudden the identity is that you're a wife and that's dying and you don't want that to die. You create this resistance in losing that identity. And that's when a lot of times, and I love to, to express this because I think the youth need to hear this. This is why the suicidal rates and the youth are growing so intensely right now is they're not understanding that the uh, death and rebirth cycle and the, how they have to lose a certain identity. You don't have to lose the physical body to lose an identity, yeah. letting those identities fall away and to transform into a new identity. So that's the one thing that I like to talk to people about a little bit is about this identity because that holds so much. It's like I'm a vice president of this company and then you lose that job. And then that's a 3D dimension earthly thing. But it's like, but that's who you were. Who are you without that? So yeah. losing that and letting learning how to let go of those identities and to see that you're first a soul because and a spirit because 200 or more years ago, humanity put spirituality first. We really did. We understood that there was this whole big, um, uh, beautiful uh, ecosystem of spirit. And we, we blessed our crops. We, we just had a different process. And over the years, as we become a richer um, world with more medications, with more money, we've started to become separate from that, which gave us grounding and, and um, joy and community in our life, which was our spirituality. And so 
as we've become more separate, that's why we've all gotten so much more depressed. It's that we're separate. We're meant to be together. We're meant to be a community. We're meant to be a tribe. So for me, the answer was to go deeper into spirituality and to not only recognize the beauty of my own soul to the point where I could actually see my own soul dancing now and recognize that all these other entities and spirits that are high vibrational, even at you or anybody here, we're talking about like, this is such a blessing just to communicate and that we are all in this together that I am never alone, even if I'm sitting alone in my room. And so that feeling of being a part of a spiritual community was deeply healing for me and so filled with love and gratitude. But the one practical tool that I use constantly and I know a lot of people are starting to talk about what I'm really happy about is grounding because as we have been programmed, like you say, we have lost our grounding because, um, we were our natural being and our, we are 50 trillion cells or something like that of energy. And we are, we normally are in nature and that's how we came to about. And we were naturally ground to the earth and the cosmos and we would feel this connection as we walked and we're losing that as we separate from all, you know, walk in all this concrete. And actually, if you think about it, all the Wi-Fi that we're around all the time, if we're energy, that's jamming our frequencies, right? So we're not able to ground and be in the full um, expression of um, being a human, having a human body with the soul attached to it. So Grounding is so important because what it does is it releases the low level energy that is swirling around in, in you, which is the resentment and the jealousy and the frustration and the uh, FOMO and the competition energy and all that stuff that's jamming our frequencies. And so if you learn how to ground, which to me is, you know, make a grounding cord two inches wider than your hips send it all the way to the center of the earth. And it could be a tree or a silo. You can decorate it. You can do anything you want. Make it sure it's hollow on the inside and release the things that are no longer serving you. That's the first thing I teach everybody. And it's very similar to how an electrician will go into a home and put in wiring into the whole house. The first thing they do is they put a grounding cord, which I always found fascinating they put a grounding cord on there and I'm like, why? If they didn't do that, they couldn't control the energy in the home. And we are mm -hmm. just these beacons of energy. So we need to be grounded and in control. And once you have that control, you can add anything to it. You can add um, recalling your energy. You can connect with the cosmos. I mean, you can add any tool on top of that grounding, but grounding is number one. And I ground everything. I ground my car, I ground my homes, I ground my animals, I ground meetings, I ground my projects, I ground my business because I release the judgment and criticism and energy that's at low vibration just by actively doing that practice to anything. Oh, that is a powerful practice to have in your life. As you're moving through, uh, Gina, you talked about writing. How did that process, because I know that process comes in after you've gone through much healing, you gain some understanding of principles and the process by which you came through. And then you began to put that pen on the paper and began to express those processes that you utilize in order to move through from A to B. When you came through, if you will, uh, how did the book came about? Um, for you to begin to move towards that? How did that project came out? Well, just to highlight her writing. So when I was a child and I was in an abusive, you know, situation, I would hide in my closet and I would write and I would write down lyrics and I would write down stuff. And so I taught myself how to read by the age of two, by listening to music and, and reading the lyrics. Mm -hmm. So when I went to school, my parents didn't understand because they never read me a book or anything. And I went to school and I already knew how to read pretty much. And the teachers were blown away. And then as I, like I said, I moved out when I was 14. So I, I had to leave school early because I had to take care of myself. So, um, I only have a ninth grade education. And so, um, I programmed myself to believe that I wasn't smart enough to be a writer. You know, I didn't have the education. 
uh, I, I would try to go back to school. I would try to learn uh, English and grammar properly. And um, I was always getting negative feedback about my writing when I would s submit it to things. So I really had, that was a huge thing I had to overcome, but I kept every time I would get letter of no, this is, you're not going to be a writer. I would, I had an agent tell me once, just, just focus on your art. Don't ever write again. And I literally didn't write for two years after that one comment. And now I look back on it and I say, oh gosh, no, nobody should be telling somebody not to do anything creative anyways, just because yeah. they don't think. And that's putting a lot of um, negative energy on someone. But I just kept going back to writing. I kept going back to that and kept going back to that. And then I started to work uh, on a project with the wife of the creator of Star Trek and he had passed away and she gave me his office to work in. And I was only like in my twenties at the time. And I started to feel his. and he wrote Star Trek. He created Star Trek. This was a beautiful creation out of his soul. And I respected it. And he would kind of energetically come to me. And that was the first time I really was like, oh my gosh, like this energy is coming to, and he would tell me to go write, to go write. And I started writing there mm -hmm. and I started writing scripts and I just started to dream because I knew that that's where like I had this expression of creativity and storytelling. And to me, it was so beautiful. And that's sort of where I really started to write. And I started writing scripts and things like that. Um, but then when my journey came and um, I started really recognizing I had healed the suicidal ideation, I wanted to share it with the world because I believe that many people who have suicidal ideation don't believe that they can heal it out of themselves. They think it's something permanent in them, like yeah. their eye color. And I wanted to say with them, no, you can actually reprogram yourself. You can get this out of your system to where you don't ever want to hurt yourself. I, and I want to show you that I've, I've done it. I want to be that hope. So as soon as I knew that in my soul that I could confirm that I don't carry suicidal ideation anymore, I can't even think a really negative thought about myself anymore. I've re I totally programmed myself away from that. And even yeah. the old memories, I'm not even able to attach to them anymore. Like I used to, they're like telling someone else's story now because I've healed them so much. Mm -hmm. I wanted to shout it out to the world. Like when you're in love, like to the millions of people suffering, no, you can heal this. Here's some, here's some examples. I've done this. Let me be your beacon of hope. So I started putting this together and then I had a podcast at the time and I had this lady come on, Dr. Amelia Kelly, and something kept telling me, ask her to write it with you, ask her. And I said, just out of nowhere, would you write this book with me? And she said, yes. And so we wrote a proposal and we sent it out and we got a bunch of offers right away from publishers. And so I said, okay, this is needed. And we wrote this book in three months and we wrote a chapter a week and it was totally in flow. And the reason why I wanted to have a clinical voice is because I knew that people, some people needed to hear a therapeutic clinical PhD voice. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want them to get into resistance with just some girl or woman who doesn't have um, a PhD or needed that. So I wanted to be able to address more people. And so it was a lot of work to make the voices work together, but mm -hmm. we found a really great rhythm. And, um, you know, and then I had the second publisher that I didn't get. So that book's called Surviving Suicidal Ideation from therapy to spirituality and the lived experience. And it's basically a workbook and I'm going to just, here's a copy of it. Yeah. And I did all of the artwork in it. There's 30 images in it and I it's channeled artwork that's healing. And then, um, another publisher came in and said, oh, we didn't get your first book. We're kind of bummed. Do you have another one in you? And I said, yes. Yeah. So I just delivered that book. I wrote it in seven weeks, 70,000 mm -hmm. words it was channeled. And, um, that's called planet walking a handbook for the living. And it's basically how to, how to be a soul here on this planet <laughs> and wow. understand what's happening to everything. And, um, that's sort of like my writing career now. So now I write articles and, you know, I became, you know, I fell into my, even though everybody told me not to do it and that it wasn't going to be a part of my life. I finally resisted the negative 
comments on that stuff. Well, everyone that is listening to us, we're going to provide all of the links for you guys to get to her to purchase those books because many people, young people, I know one of the reasons why I put the podcast together was because of a close friend of mine that did commit suicide. And I had an opportunity to talk to her for, for and prevented her, well, stopped her for a moment. And then later on, she, she did it many years later. So any of you that are listening about suicide and stuff like that, uh, here is someone that has been through that journey and has uh, found a way out and has learned how to eliminate that identity and not who you are. And so we want to provide all the stuff for you guys to get to her and uh, have access to her so that you can uh, allow yourself to live, you know. So as you are now in this space in your life right here, uh, what is it do you sense that is needed right now beyond the things? And I think that you're talking about Gene Roddenberry uh, was that author with um, Star Trek. And uh, what is it you sense that you're being drawn to as a result of some of the changes that are happening here on this planet as we are moving into um, other aspects of the timeline of things. What is it that you feel is on your heart that you'd like to leave here on this podcast for all those that are uh, with us? Community, community, community. We've lost our community. We have too many lonely people in this world. Too many lonely people in this world. We need to. We need to go back to bring. We need to all take care of the kids. We need to respect the elder. Too many people in, in older facilities all by themselves with nobody going to visit them. We lost yeah. it. We have to all. We just have to go. But that's why we're so miserable and so terrified. We're giving too much money and power to the things that aren't serving us and dividing us, like politics and things like that. We are it all you know that's just dividing us further we have to all if we all come together a little bit more and recognize that there's so much of a better life to be in a tribe and to respect that tribe and that every individual whatever their characteristics are that the way that they are built and the way that they're here on this planet the way that they show up is perfect we drop our judgments the energy of judgment and criticism Mm -hmm. and and it's just creating fear and chaos and the way that we're throwing it on each other is is terrible and the other really big point i've been saying a lot to people now is because the numbers of children suicides from 10 to 14 is growing rapidly they are mimicking the adults so as yeah. adults we have to be kinder we have to watch what we say online everything we put out in the world is a reflection of us and it reflects to people around us and to the children So we have to think about 10 steps ahead. Even if it's like, I just have to say that negative comment to that one other adult. Children are seeing this. Children are feeling this vibration. If you're not going to do it for yourself, do it for the children. As adults, we have to protect the children on this planet. And so sometimes people need to hear that to say, oh, as an adult, I'm kind of acting sometimes not of my highest vibration. I don't represent the best things in this world. I'm going to scale back on all that negative online comments. I'm going to scale back on that judgment of other people. I'm going to focus on on the tribe and the community again and help the people around me. And knowing that just me being a good adult human is actually helping the children of the world. So if you're not going to just do it for yourself, do it for our kids because they're suffering greatly and they're just mimicking what they see adults do. Children are becoming bullies and they're choosing to end their life early because they're watching people do it. So adults, so as adults, we have to be a little bit better. I want to thank you, Gina, for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. That's so powerful. I have nothing to say after that. And so we are going to provide all of her links for you guys to get to her so that you can learn and get some help, you know, because she's here. And that's one of the reasons why this has started. Uh, we were talking, you talked about community. My fiance and I had a discussion today about uh, finding the right um, gang or friends, if you will, to that uplifts, up, you know, just uplifts you 
and that constantly bringing you down that helps you to grow and become uh, stronger. So find your community, guys. It's really important that you do that. Uh, again, in all of our life, we, we are still uh, moving towards that. So I want to second that, as I said with uh, earlier with Gina. And so uh, we're going to provide everything for you guys to reach her. And I just want to thank you so much for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. Thank you. Many hugs and blessings to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Threads of Enlightenment with Ken Primus. Hopefully you're now feeling more empowered to overcome the challenges in your life, whatever they may be. Share that inspiration with others by telling them about this podcast, rating it, and of course, remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. For more connection, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram by searching for Threads of Enlightenment. Until next time, stay enlightened.